One of the speakers I could listen to for many, many hours is Jeff Watson. I mean, you know he's incredibly smart. One of the challenges that really smart people have is talking at a level that, that I can understand. Would you guys agree? <laughs> Jeff is one of the guys that's incredibly, unbelievably smart, but also a gifted enough communicator that, that I can understand it, okay? It's one of the things I appreciate about Jeff, along with his integrity, um, his faith, his priorities, his core values, the way he lives his life for freedom, and his love of the country, okay? So that's my little bit unconventional introduction from Mr. Jeff Watson. Stand up real quick, and let's give a loud round of applause. All right, thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. It is, a, it is an honor to be here. I am grateful for the privilege to be here. I'm grateful for the people who spoken before me today and the people who spoke yesterday. And I'm gonna just take a couple minutes and get warmed up and find out where this thing sounds good for me and you. So let me just get started by asking a couple of questions. How many of you have never heard me speak before? Okay, that's important. There's a couple of, there, how many of you were here six months ago when I spoke before? All right, <clears throat> so there's a couple things that have changed. My name's Jeff. I need to tell you right now, I am not woke and I am not PC. I will not try to offend. My preferred pronouns are y'all and youin. My mandatory adjectives are smart and good looking. Okay? That is humor. That's the best I can come at it. So. Just, just, just give me a minute here. Um, those of you of faith, just join me for a moment. God in heaven, let the words of my mouth, let the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Amen. All right, this is uh, intimidating for me to talk to such a talented audience. And I want to talk to you about a lot of things, but I want to give you some very practical how to do it as well. So I'm going to talk about tax-free investing, what beginning and intermediate investors need to understand about self-directed retirement account investing. But before I can dive into that, I've got a few preliminaries that I have to cover, and I've got to figure out to make sure I don't ever cross through the light, because that's one thing I got taught long ago, never pass through the light while you're speaking. But I also have to give you these uh, disclaimers and disclosures. While I happen to be licensed to practice law in one state, I am not currently giving out any sort of tax, legal accounting, or financial advice whatsoever. This is just education, and it may or may not make any sense to you. It may all be gobbledygook. Um, but I do need to make sure you understand it's designed to provide accurate and authoritative information with regard to the subject matter covered. This is education and not legal advice. It's provided with the understanding that the presenter is not engaged in rendering legal, accounting, or other professional advice. If legal or other professional assistance is required, the services of a competent professional must be acquired. Secondly, I need to let you know that this presentation is the intellectual property and wholly owned by both the Jeffrey S. Watson Law Firm and Nerd in Charge, LLC. I wish the nerd that's in charge could be here. Um, but she's not today. She's, she's facing some health issues in Dallas. Uh, you may not use any of the images, graphics, or animations. This information is being shared for educational purposes for this event only. All other rights are reserved. Therefore, if you do not have Jim Ingersoll and my consent, you don't get to reuse this, period. End of story. A little bit about who I am. Practicing law now for over 30 years in the state of Ohio. Um, general counsel to a couple of interesting companies like RealFlow, um, National Real Estate Investors Association, Note School, National Wealth Builders. I've been a real estate investor on a part-time basis for over 27 years, and I'm a full-time practicing attorney. The vast majority of my clients are doing deals with their self-directed retirement accounts. A Couple more things I wanna share with you. Um, we're gonna get into some of it here. Board member of Quest Trust Company. I'm the only non-Texan on the board. That is, I mean, Ashley, that's something, right? Fellow board member here in the room. Um, I am just, it is a pinch me, am I really dreaming 
honor to have somebody like Quincy Long ask me to be there to be an advisor. That is big time stuff for a company that's on its way marching from over two billion in assets to three billion in assets under management. Um, I've changed national housing policy three times. I'm gonna talk about those in a minute. Um, Co-authored an amendment that's currently pending in HR 5013 to reform Dodd-Frank, Safe, and Tiller on seller financing. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, 2008, I got started. I was an absolute nobody until I figured out a way to do short sales faster, simpler, and better for back-to-back -back transactional closing. Um, then a bunch of gurus decided that they wanted to use my paperwork, and so that kind of made me popular. I've changed the law in the state of Ohio five times, four times in litigation, once in legislation. So I understand some of these things that are on there. And then I've got two different real estate investor clients that have made the Inc. 500 list of privately held fast-growing companies. Anybody know what that list is? You see it every now and then. It comes out once a year. Privately held, fastest-growing companies. They rank them. Who's growing the fastest? So I've got one client that made it two years in a row. And I own a company that also made that list in 2011. So I've seen hockey stick growth, both inside and outside. And I tell you a lot of this because I'm trying to set the stage for what's about to come. And folks, that's this. I'm going to give you very lovingly, but somewhat firmly, a hard punch to the mouth. I find that real estate investors need to have it put in very clear, simple language that they then know how to take action with. All right? And I'm going to tell you something that should have you all on high alert and my friend, Dr. David Phelps, referred to that a little bit today. He set the stage for me perfectly. And I want to make sure you understand that today, unlike any other time, the contents of your wallet have been weaponized in international warfare. The dollar is a weapon. The Visa logo, the MasterCard logo on your plastics is a weapon. You doubt me? Read the news. What's the United States doing to Russia right now? What, did ha what happened when you didn't politically do something right in Canada? GoFundMe took your money away? Your dollars are being weaponized. All right? If that doesn't scare you, then I don't know what to tell you, okay? We've got to adjust. Now, if, how many of you were real estate investors before 2000? Yeah, that's the crowd I figured be up. So this, y'all understand this one, Leon and David, and some of the others in the room, you're going to understand this comment so well. We've heard many polite and, and uh, appropriate conferences and references to the late Jack Miller. Okay? When I first started showing up at Jack's event, I was lost in the first 30 minutes. The man was just that brilliant. Lights out brilliant. And I have learned so much from him and his other protégés and mentors like... Dyke Spotiford, John Schaub, Pete Fortunato, David Tilney, Lyle Wall, to name a few. Um, and the fact that they're all friends of mine is just am amazing to me. Um, so I'll just tell you this. If you didn't know Jack, and if you've not learned from someone that has learned from Jack, like Jim Ingersoll has, then you don't know Jack about real estate investing. <laughs> it's that simple. <clears throat> you don't know Jack because you only know one thing. You know a market that has only done one thing, up, 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 and up. And folks, you get ready. We're ready to about see this roller coaster ride, take some twists and some turns, and I'm, gonna, I'm so excited for you because if you take what I'm teaching you this morning, you're going to have an unparalleled opportunity to be the right person at the right time to make a lot of money 
because capital markets are going to dry up. The institutional capital markets are going to dry up in the next 12 to 18 months like a bottle of water spilled on the Strip of Vegas in the middle of the day. It's gonna be there and then it's gonna be gone, okay? Now I'm gonna just flat out tell you, if you're chicken and you don't wanna do this, then I'll tell you what you can do. You can take your money and you can put it with people like Jeff Shahusky, Wendy Sweet, Tom Barry, and let them do it because I know that they know what they're doing, okay? So I'm gonna talk about how to be the third pig. Now don't panic, but um, Sean, I just wanna tell you thank you very much for this shirt on Be the Third Pig, all right? Thank you very much for that. It ain't all coming off, so there's no music. <laughs> all right? All right. So, how to be the third pig. Are you familiar with the story of the three pigs? Pigs one and two were, YOLO, baby, you only live once. Party, 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 we're gonna have fun. The market can only go up. Let's go, come on. We can refinance and pay off our credit cards. Let's go, come on. Oh yeah, we can. Well, let's max out those cards one more time. Let's refinance again in two more years, pay those cards off and keep going. Europe? Another SUV? Come on, man, I got it, okay? Those, that's pigs one and two. What did the third pig do? What did she do? She built a house out of bricks. She took the time. She had the right foundation. She used the right materials. She built in a good location. And when things hit the fan, what happened? Her siblings were there with her because they had nowhere else to go, all right? So I want you to be the third pig. So here's another way of saying this. Allow me, in these next few minutes, to teach you how to play by the rules and cheat like mad at the same time. We all good with that? Is anybody opposed to the idea of making money, having fun, and not paying taxes? All right. Yeah, I was hoping I could get that kind of response. So what is an IRA? The IRS definition of an individual retirement arrangement, or IRA, is a personal savings plan which allows you to set aside money for retirement while offering you tax advantages. Amounts in your IRA, including earnings, generally are not taxed until distributed to you. However, any, any amounts remaining in your IRA upon your death can be paid to your beneficiary or beneficiaries. So how many of you have an IRA? Great. How many of you have one where you self-direct your IRA? From shameless self-promotional plug, how many of you have an IRA with Quest Trust that you self-direct? How many of you are going to have an IRA with Quest Trust? <laughs> good, 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 good. So self-directing is incredibly important. And how many of you were here back in September? Quincy was here? All right, this is important. I need you to listen to me. Do you remember what was going on in September when we were here? What was going on? They were trying to take it away. Okay, so this is a picture of me a month after I was here. I was in Washington, D.C., doing some meetings October 26th on getting the self-directed IRA killing language removed from the Build Back Better bill. Bob Repass from Colonial Funding, uh, one of the founders of the Seller Finance Coalition. We bootstrapped on top of them for the IRA industry. That's myself, and then that's Congressman Henry Cuellar. Henry was the first Democrat that we turned over to get him to go against that language in the bill. Just out of curiosity, how many of you in this room took advantage of the information on John Heyer's website of Hands Off My IRA? Go ahead and stand up. Just go ahead and stand up. These are people that are heroes. They did the job. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was the thousands and tens of thousands of emails and phone calls and faxes and letters to district offices that made it to when I showed up on the 26th of October, they wanted to know what they could do to stop the noise. They were getting swarmed. 
Now, I have a question for you, folks. When your friend is in a fight, what do you do? Do you stand off and take odds? Do you, make, do you, do you play bookie? Or do you show up? Our friend, Henry Cuellar, is in a fight. I went to D.C. last night. I'd have loved to have hang out, hung out with all of you last night. I would have loved to. Last night, he was hosting a fundraiser. Cheapest ticket to get in the door was 500 bucks. I was there. Why? Henry's my friend. I spent three days in San Antonio earlier th last month. I think it was last, I don't even remember what it is anymore, folks. It's blurred together. <sighs> yeah, it was the end, of, the end of February. Three days in San Antonio, in the rain, cold, windy, knocking on doors for Henry, getting people to be ready to vote for him in a primary election. He won the primary, but he didn't win it by enough. Let me explain. In Texas, you have to win 50% of the vote he fell about 1,200 votes of getting 50%. So now he's in a runoff against a 28-year-old young lady that he's already now beaten twice. This lady has one local supporter, one local endorser, but she has the likes of Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and AOC coming to San Antonio and campaigning for her. She's getting money from all of the extreme left side of the world. Now, she's only 28 years old. I know when I was 28, I didn't have my head out of my tailpipe, okay? I was still practicing law, but I had a clue. So, he's in a fight. And I'm going to just flat out tell you, you show up. Now, you're going to say, Jeff, why are you doing this? Well, I'm going to give you a reason why I want you to do this later on. But... I I want you to go to Henry's website, henryacquire.com. There's a donate button and click it. And for those of you that do that, screenshot it, because I'm going to give you an opportunity to benefit from that, okay? Henryacquire.com, hit the donate button. Screenshot your donation. Hopefully, you'll do 250 or higher. I think, two, well, 250 is the highest you can do on his website. That's great. That would be a great number. But I want you to do that. Now, you're going to say, well, Jeff, why are you doing all this? Well, the legislation to roll back the seller financing restrictions in Dodd-Frank, the first Democrat on board, Henry Cuellar. That was four terms of Congress ago. Who was the second guy on board this time? Henry Cuellar. Who was the first out of the Democrats to say, I'm not voting for Build Back Better because it has SDRA killing language? Henry Cuellar was the first guy. Because he wouldn't do it, then his friend Vincente Gonzalez wouldn't do it. And when I got Vincente convinced, he went and got his friend Josh Gottheimer. And Josh Gottheimer said, it's coming out of the bill. And the next day, it was out of the bill. Now, I don't know how many of you paid attention. But the, the bill that the House passed, the Build Back Better bill that the House passed, that eventually went to the Senate and died, that had a lot of bad IRA stuff in it, but it was missing the two segments that John Heyer and I were screaming about. It was missing the two segments that Quincy Long was screaming about. It was missing the two segments that all of you that stood up took time out of your busy schedules to go scream about, okay? That's what we got out, okay? Because of people like Henry Cuellar, we got it out of there. All right, so let's go back to this. IRS definition of what is an IRA. That's pretty cool, right? You can grow money tax-free. That's what it basically says. But it gets better. What is a Roth IRA? A Roth IRA is a retirement account where contributions are made from taxable earned income. Okay. Earnings made using the funds in the IRA go back into the Roth IRA tax-free. Yeah, that's typical 26 U.S.C. 408 language. Ah, uh, but wait. Distributions of contributions and earnings are tax-free. Now, folks, if that doesn't get you excited, your wood is wet. <laughs> really wet. And I don't think there's enough kerosene and a blowtorch to get you going, okay? All right. So here's my favorite part of the tax code. Any qualified distribution from a Roth IRA shall not be includable in gross income. 
shall not be includable in gross income. So if it's not includable in gross income, what does that mean? It means it doesn't make it to your adjusted gross income. It doesn't make it to your modified adjusted gross income, and it certainly doesn't make it to your net income or your taxable income. Now, is that a good thing or is that a great thing? That's a great thing, all right? So how, that's powerful. All right, so what is self-directed investing? The account holder makes decisions and investments on behalf of his retirement account through his qualified trustee or custodian like Quest Trust Company, okay? You see that in the slide where it says like Quest Trust Company? Oh, anyhow, that's a joke. You can invest in many, many different things. And there are a variety of accounts that you can self-direct like a Roth IRA. I'm just gonna talk about Roth IRAs because I presume that we're all smart enough to know how to get to a Roth IRA. And if you don't, you need to talk to Derek or some of the colleagues that Derek has at Quest. So let me talk to you about two important rules about self-directed IRA investing. Always fund all of your accounts at $6,000 or so per year. 401ks, you can put in about three times as much of that, but for your IRAs, your HSAs, et cetera, $500 a month, $500 a month, $500 a month, okay? Now, I'm going to just get really personal here for a second as I cut through this part of the audience. If y'all are spending more money, see, I used one of my favorite pronouns right there, right, y'all? You hear that? If y'all are spending more money every month on that vehicle with four tires that you don't live in than you are putting in your retirement account, y'all need to rethink what you're doing, okay? If your car payment or, God forbid, your fleece payment is more than what you're putting in your retirement savings, your priorities are out of whack. Now, if you're a person of faith, I'm going to tell you this. If you're spending more on your car than you're putting in the offering plate, you and Jesus need to have a conversation. Okay? All right. I'm, I'm, I might preach a little bit more. Is that going to be okay? All right. So let's get, let's see if I can, ah, there we go. Now, the other important thing is this. You need to know the prohibited transaction rules or you better hire someone who does. Now, I'm going to show you a shortcut to the prohibited transaction rules. And for me to say that, Quincy, if he was here, would probably leap up and tackle me for implying that there's a shortcut to the rules that he has mastered. No one knows them better than Quincy Long, okay? But I've found a shortcut. We're going to talk about disqualified persons, okay? Green or good, red or bad. Okay? You're in the middle. You're black. You're the account holder. You cannot do deals with the people in red. You cannot do deals with the people in red. People in green, you can do deals with. You're like, okay, Jeff, that's easy. Well, but is that the shortcut? No, that's not the shortcut. Y'all want the shortcut? You do? That didn't sound, that didn't sound enthusiastic, Dave. Okay, let me give you the shortcut. Lend out of your IRA only to people that you're willing to sue, foreclose on, and chase afterwards if they don't pay. Okay? Seth and I are friends. Okay? But if I lend Seth some money, secured by a piece of real estate, and he doesn't pay me, do you think I'm going to let our friendship stop me from suing him? Nope. Foreclosing on him? No way. If I have a deficiency, you think I'm going to make, chase him on that personal guarantee I make him sign? You better believe it. Do that. That is your shortcut rule. If the relationship you have with that person is such that you're, not, that you're afraid of doing that, oh, well, you know, then what? They're a prohibited party to you. Because if you're not ruthless about protecting your money, forget it. If you would foreclose on your brother, then lend him money. Okay? because he's actually not disqualified, all right? <laughs> yeah, well, for your know-it-all brother-in-law that's broker than, broker than a joke, I don't know if you want to do deals with them or not. Anyhow, so let's talk about focusing on some of the fundamentals. Establish your investment parameters, types of investing. I've already alluded to my favorite one, which is private lending. Why? Because it's simple when you understand all of the nuances that you gotta play into it. Now, should you just all on your own just decide to go do private lending by yourself? Absolutely not. You need to spend some time educating yourself on how to do it. This is a little bit of education on how to do that. There's a lot more 
through Freedom Founders. There's a lot more through Inner Circle here. There's a lot more through all the, web, all the stuff on Quest website and such. So let's talk about this. We also want to make sure that we establish your investment parameters. Degree of risk and reward. What are you looking for? What are your objectives? What are your goals when making an investment with your self-directed IRA? I know Ashley does a lot of lending out of her self-directed IRA, and Ashley probably has written down a checklist of things to do, and one of those is the rate of return will be this or higher. Okay? I have one too. I won't do a deal unless the rate of return is high enough to make it worthwhile to me. Okay? So, for example, I like to do deals where my ROI is 37% or higher. Now, there's a reason why I like 37. What's 37 times 2? 74, right? What's the rule of 72? You double your money with the rule of 72. It's how you compound it. So if I'm lending and making 37% on my money, I get to double my money every two years. Is that an okay rate of return, Leon? It's, I'm, I know. I know. There's deals where I've done a little bit better. There's deals where I haven't done quite so well. We'll talk a little bit about some of that, okay? But that's just me, and I don't do this, I'm not talking about bragging, I'm gonna show you how to make these kind of deals, okay? So what does your typical deal look like? Well, let's do this. This is a really important concept. Because your money in a Roth IRA is so precious, because it's so hard to get it in there and so little that you can put in, you want to protect it. You don't want to be doing guinea pig, trial and error, experimental stuff with your self-directed IRA. So I tell my clients, if you haven't done it successfully outside of an IRA, don't attempt to do it inside of an IRA. All right? It's a whole lot, letter, it's a whole lot easier to learn how to babysit a kid before it's your kid than to wait until you're a parent, right? How many parents in the room would agree with me on that? Okay. How many grandparents in the room? I have one granddaughter. I love her to pieces. And if I would have known that she was going to be that cute and that adorable, I'd have probably been kinder to her mom. Okay? <laughs> but anyhow. All right. So typical deal look like, for me, a typical deal is where I lend some money and I get it back. So one of my favorite things to do is a 10 for 12 deal. I picked this up um, from Mr. Henry. And I know there's others in the Jack Miller world that have done it the same way, but Mr. Henry, he's now passed on. Henry Dvorkin from Wichita Falls, Texas. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Yeah, I figured you two would. Mr. Henry taught me this. Um, a 10 for 12 deal. So here, how many of you know a landlord? How many of you know a landlord? Aside from looking in the mirror. <laughs> or aside from looking to your spouse. Okay? Um, how many of you know a landlord? How many of you know a land how many of you know many landlords? Lots and lots of landlords. Okay. All right. Folks, I'm not selling you anything, so you can raise your hands, okay? <laughs> These aren't trial closes. I don't have any implanted bombs, no neuro-linguistic programming. Folks, there's no credit card machine in the back of the room, okay? This is audience participation time, all right? How many of you know a landlord who occasionally needs a chunk of cash? How many of you know a landlord coming out of COVID that is owed huge chunks of cash, doesn't have the money to pay their tax bills, doesn't have the money to keep their insurance in place, needs to fix the HVAC, needs to fix the roof. Can I go on or do you follow me? All right? So here's what we can do with them. We can go, a landlord, they receive $1,000 a month in rent from a good unit with a decent tenant. Landlord needs $10,000 in cash. Offer the landlord $10,000 in cash now in exchange for the next 12 months of rent at $1,000 a month. I'm going to give, Kevin, I'm going to give you $10,000 right now. And you're going to give me 12 payments over the next, several, over the next 12 months of $1,000 a month. Is that going to help you with your current situation? 
because you got housing and building breathing down your neck about the fact that you've got a roof leak and your AC's out, right? That'll fix the problem, right? Okay. So there you go. Now, that's a simple loan. Now, what are we going to do with it? We're going to document the deal. Pay attention to this. We're going to document the deal with a promissory note, with an assignment of rents, and a mortgage or deed of trust, and I might even throw in a personal guarantee. Okay? Now, I'm pretty sure that my mortgage and deed of trust is going to be in a second or junior lien position, but I'm not going to freak out about that. All right? I'm not going to freak out about that. So the loan of $10,000 receives back $12,000. Who's got a financial calculator and wants to punch that in and come up and tell me what the ROI is on that? I do have it memorized. I do have it memorized, but part of the presentation is to ask. And normally, I get somebody who has to actually look at the calculator before they do it off the top of their head. But Normally, you're not in the room. <laughs> it's all good, man. It's all good. I know why people follow you around. It's all good. All right. So 35.07%, um, okay? Is that a good enough rate of return? Now, take that 35% rate of return, and that's because you're going to be putting the money back out again. This is, these are rinse and repeat deals. Rinse and repeat deals. And after two years, what's happened to your money at that 35% rate of return? You've almost doubled it. Is that pretty good? Or are you guys like, well, Jeff, you know, talking to a landlord, getting an application, getting a loan application from them, making them sign a note, recording the deed of trust, getting them to sign the assignment of rents, that's too much work, I'm just gonna live on social security. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just, it'll just be easier if I just live on social insecurity. Yeah, insecurity, yeah. I started using that line about 20 years ago. Um, so folks, these deals are pretty simple, all right? And the paperwork I listed on the screen, I, and I named a little bit more of that. Remember what all I named down. What did all I name down? Like a loan application, a promissory note, an assignment of rents, personal guarantee, and a mortgage or a deed of trust, right? Five pieces of paper. There's a reason I'm emphasizing that, so remember that, okay? Just remember that. Rap loans, okay. I got no musical skills within me whatsoever and I have no rhythm, and I'm lousy at gift wrapping. The scotch tape and the wrapping paper and I, we just don't get along, but I can wrap a note. I just want you to know, I can wrap a note, all right? So let's talk about that. Who are the players? Because until you break this down and understand this, you're gonna be like me and you're gonna hear people talk about rapping and you're not gonna know what they're referring to and you're gonna be like, oh, okay, and then you're too embarrassed to say you don't understand. But it was on a cruise many, many years ago when Dorsey Botiford, now Dorsey Botiford Cooney, Dykes' daughter, explained this in language that I could understand. And then I got serious about rapping, okay? I got really serious about rapping. So let's talk about who's out there. We've got the civilian, institutional money. Be really careful about bank lines of credit. When David said that earlier, I was like ready to stand up and scream, amen, because bank lines of credit scare me. They're so easy to call. They're so easy to freeze. Or you have an ender lender, somebody that's got a lot of money, and they don't have the ability to keep it all working themselves, and so they're looking to put money out with other people. All right? And you're the wrapping lender. If you're wondering where you are on the screen, you're in the middle, you're the wrapping lender. And then you've got the property owner, buyer, or borrower, okay? We can call them all sorts of different things. So let's get into this. The borrower needs money. Can you imagine being a real estate investor and finding a great deal in this market and not having enough money to pay cash and close on the deal? Can anybody relate to that? Yeah, I mean, I bought three houses in January. I didn't have enough cash to close on all of them. I still got them. 
you know? So you locate the money. You can negotiate the terms. You negotiate the terms both with the borrower that needs the money and with the other person who's got the money, the ender lender, the civilian, the overworked doctor, dentist, lawyer, Indian chief, corporate executive, high pay, highly paid salesperson, whatever they are. They're too busy in the corporate grind thinking that, you know, um, all the status that goes with that is really sweet. You negotiate with them as well, all right? And then you build some money. You build some money behind the large note and you put the spread into yours. And we're going to walk through how we do this, okay? So let's recap. We got three people in the deal. We got the civilian. They've got money. They want their money out working, but they don't want to do it themselves. Little or no effort on their part. There's you. You've got a little bit of money. You've got connections with both the property owner investor who's got the great deal and the civilian, and you have a knowledge of investing. If you had to, you could step in and take over the rehab project and see it across the finish line, okay? It's not your passion, but you could do it. Or maybe it is part of your skill set, and that's all you do. And then you find the other person on the end of the deal that they have a great deal, but they need money to fund the deal. Now, I know from my dealings with Jeff, that Jeff's company gets calls multiple times every hour of people who have deals and are looking for money. Is Tom in the room? Okay. Wendy, what, how many calls an hour do you guys get from people needing to borrow money or wanting to borrow money? Every five minutes. So by my calculations, that's about 12 an hour. Yeah, you'll take it. So there's a lot of people out there with deals looking for money. So do you believe me that, or is that just something that you just said, well, it's a seminar, and he said it, so it must be true. Which is it? How many of you believe that there's a lot of people out there looking for money for deals? That means they're finding deals. They may not be deals that you'll fund, but they're finding deals. Okay? So let's move on. So we're going to put these people together, and you're going to pull it all together. I'm going to give you two examples. So I ran across the guy a few years ago. He was a lawyer in Chicago. He needed $30,000 for this little deal he was doing. He had a sweetheart deal. He had worked away with the bankruptcy trustee. He was going to be able to buy this property. Wasn't on the MLS, and he was going to get it way below value. And he was willing to pay me $36,000 over 10 months. So I found somebody who had $29,700 that they wanted to put to work. And I found somebody else who had 300 bucks in a small Roth account. Now, it wasn't too hard for me to find that person who had the 300 bucks in their Roth account. Because that was my mom. <laughs> mom only had $300 cash in her Roth. And it was bothering me that the cash wasn't working. So we put her into this deal. So we funded the deal, and we made 10 payments. We only did it over 10 payments. We didn't do 12. Um, so we had 10 payments of 3,500 bucks come in. So the lady with the 29.7, her name was Carol, she only made a 34.87% rate of return. Um, the 300 bucks pulled in a 373% rate of return. And three came, came back in. So when this deal was done with just the interest and then the equity participation, that we built into the back end of it, but just don't worry about the equity participation. We turned the 300 into 3,000. Then I took the same 3,000 and rolled it into an IRA trust, along with 3,000 of my money into the trust. So we started with six, and we're up to a, right around 100 in it now. Okay, so we're doing okay. But we'll show you how we did that. Okay, so what's the wrap? The 300 dollars wrapped and included the $29,700 for a total loan of $30,000. That's the way I papered that deal, okay? Pretty simple. Borrower made two payments. We split the money apart, and we're bang, we're done, we're happy, okay? So now I'm gonna break it down and I'm gonna run it through with much more realistic, much more current numbers, okay? 
Now, these numbers are Cleveland, Ohio numbers, okay? Civilian Ender has $150,000 that she's willing to loan at 9.5% interest. That's the conversation I had with Carol two weeks ago. She just had gotten paid off on another deal. She's got about 150 k sitting at her Kingdom Trust IRA account. And if she can make nine and a half on it, she is thrilled. Okay? Because she knows that she just has to do what I tell her to do, sign the papers where I tell her to sign it, and the money goes to work. An investor has a home he wants to purchase, and he needs $160,000 to fund the deal. And he's willing to pay 12% interest. Now, you notice I'm keeping it simple. There's no points on the screen. So don't confuse this with points. The wrapping investor has $10,000 in a connection with both Carol and the person buying the house that needs $160,000. Are we good there? Is everybody with me? Okay. I don't know because with so many people in the room, there's a good chance I've got somebody confused. Okay, thank you. So, I've got somebody who needs $160,000, right? They got a house to buy and fix up and they need $160,000 to do it. Carol's got $150,000. Is that enough to fund the deal by itself? Nope. Close, but not quite. Well, for me, I'll just pick on me, I got $10,000, so I'm like Pete Fortunato. I got a deal, but I'm light. I'm like 150 light to fund the deal, okay? Those of you that know Pete know that I'm pretty accurate, right? So I got to find Carol's 150 to go with my 10 and put it together to lend it to the person who needs the 160 to buy the house, okay? You can buy a decent rental in Cleveland right now for right around 160 and fix it all up and so on, and you're going to be in a fairly decent neighborhood, okay? You're not going to be in all the great neighborhoods, but you'll be okay. And I'm talking Cleveland. I'm not talking the suburbs. I'm certainly not talking Rocky River, Lakewood, Shaker, and so on, all right? Um, so we, we've got those facts down. The borrower will pay 12% interest on the whole $160,000. Understand that. They will pay 12% interest on the whole 160. But Carol isn't going to get 12% on her 150. She's thrilled with nine and a half. So what does that leave? That leaves a spread. Yes. I'm trying to think of my favorite sandwich spread. And I think it's probably Captain Sorensen's firehouse sauce, but anyhow. That's not a spread for a sandwich, though. But yeah, I like Chick-fil-A sauce. Do you know it's 140 calories in a package of that stuff? <laughs> you know, I don't even want to know how much is on the, how many calories are in the Polynesian packages because I take three of them and pour that on my market salad and that is like lunch. Oh, but anyhow. I did not know that. That is a fantastic fun fact. Yeah, I blitzed, I blitzed through Fredericksburg last night too. Yeah. All right. So let's get back to reality. Get away from Chick-fil-A. Wait, wait a second. Chick-fil-A is reality. Okay. All right. So anyhow, um, we've got an opportunity. We've got some spread. We've got, by my mathematical calculations, about 3.5% of interest looking for a home to go pay to somebody, right? So let's do this. So how is this deal structured? <clears throat> well, we got 9.5% and we got 12%. We got a $160,000 wrap loan earning 12%. And we've got a $150,000 underlying loan earning 9.5%. This is where it always got confusing to me, so I'm just taking it slowly here with you. We have the loan of $160,000 collecting 12% interest but we have an underlying loan of 150 that's only getting paid at nine and a half. So let's look at some numbers. 
The civilian ender, we're, we're running this out on six months, I'm six years, I'm sorry, 72 months, six years. 9.5%, 72 months, $150,000 present value, financial calculator should say $2,741.20. Does that sound right, Leon? That's close enough, okay. All right. <clears throat> Now, 2741, 9.5% on $150,000 paid out over, amortized on a six year basis. Okay? What kind of profit is now in this deal for the wrap investor? Well, let's take a look. They receive a payment of $3,128.03. How did we calculate that? How did we calculate that payment? 160 at 12% over a six-year amortization. So if we're running on a financial calculator, the term is 72 months. The interest rate is 12%. Present value is 160. Future value zero, you solve per payment, okay? And depending on which calculator you use, you're gonna hit right around that number. Now my HB 10-2s, that's what they get, okay? So out of that payment, what are we doing with that payment though? I gotta get close enough so where my clicker works. There we go. Out of that payment of $3,128.03, we have to remit $2,741.20 to the other investor. So we have to pay Carol $2,741.20. Now, let me just do a little detour here. There's two ways of doing this. I do it two different ways. Sometimes my borrower writes two checks. Sometimes my borrower writes one check. They write the one check, it gets deposited into my LLC, my, that's actually, it's a trust, my IRA-owned trust account, and my IRA trustee then writes a check to Carol. All right? And so we do that. I mean, while I've been on the road this last few days, one of my, one of my borrowers made a payment, and I told my assistant, I said, I checked online, the payment got in, the payment cleared the bank, the check didn't bounce, like it had in the past with him. I said, go ahead and cut Glenn his check, because I got a guy by the name of Glenn, cut Glenn his check for his amount of money. So within a day or two of me knowing the funds are good, my check to Glenn's going out. It's coming out of the same trust account that the payment was made into the residue stays in my account, all right? So real quickly, who's got a calculator and will subtract 27.41 and 20 cents from 3,128.03? Okay, so I'm just I'm gonna steal all the show. Take that number and that is your payment with a present value of $10,000, your term is 72 months, future value zero, solve for your rate of return. Anybody doing that? Yeah, well, there you go. So if you solve it, if you set it up and run it that way, <clears throat> Jeff, am I right? Four, two, six, seven. Yeah, well, rounding differences, right? <clears throat> four, two, point six, six versus four, two, point six, seven. That's not that big of a difference. You know, one one hundredth. Um, how many of you would be thrilled to take ten thousand dollars in your Roth IRA and put it to work for six years, where it's making forty-two percent a year? I just showed you how to do it, okay? Now, some of you are gonna be like, well, Jeff, you know, last year was a really good year. All that money I left sitting in the Vanguard S&P 500 index, it made 39%. And 39 is really close to 42.6. Yeah, you're right. What's the Vanguard done, 500 S&P index done this year, huh? It's down over 10%. How's that look compared to your 42%? 42 
Anybody, anybody get excited about this? Okay. I mean, I'm trying to figure out, is this like, you're just waiting for me to shut up so you can go get food? Or you're like, you know, he's, he's teaching me something I already know, so he's boring as all get out. This is like watching paint dry. Thank you. Now it makes me feel better. Okay, so that explains why I'm getting the energy I'm getting in the room, which is you're taking it all in going gulp, gulp, gulp. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, Leon, I know you've done raps, and Jeff, and Kevin, and David, and Paul. Paul, we did a rap deal. We tried to do a rap deal the other day, didn't we? We had some bird brain lawyer that didn't know how to read. The borrower's lawyer couldn't read and understand the paperwork. I'm like, dude, it's in English. It's in English. I will not tell your client if you don't want me to that you don't know how to read. But whatever. I mean, it was, I mean, Paul did all the work, set it all up, just emailed me, said, Jeff, I need these docs this way. I prepare all the paperwork. Borrower's lawyer looks at it and goes, I don't understand this. I won't let her sign it. Oh boy, okay, anyhow, I thought you were supposed to be competent before you took on a matter. Oh, I know, I, I think the lawyer killed the deal. I don't think it was the borrower. Not all lawyers are equal. Yes, ma'am, you're right, Ashley. Not all lawyers are created equal. So here's a question, okay? Here's a question for you. Well, actually, before I get to the question, I gotta set it up with this. So when I do these deals, I spell it out to where an eighth grader can understand what I'm telling them. I tried. So I use a closing instruction letter that goes to the title company or the closing attorney, and I tell them this is what I want done. The deed from blank to blank should be recorded first. So this would be the deed from the seller to the buyer. The buyer is my borrower. That gets recorded first. I mean, that's like title company 101, okay? Then, immediately following the recording of the deed, the first position mortgage from Carol for the amount of $150,000 is to be recorded. Immediately thereafter, the mortgage in favor of Jeff Watson's trust for $160,000, wrap mortgage, by the word there, the word wrap is there to go like, duh, it's a wrap, please pay attention should be recorded, okay? So do we get an idea of how we're gonna do this in a chain reaction? Boom, 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 okay? Deed first, 150, 160 afterwards, okay? Bang, 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 all right? So somebody's gonna be like, well, Jeff, I'm confused. How much does the borrower really owe? Do they owe 160 or do they owe 310? Because we've got two mortgages out there, one for 160 and one for 150. And we're making them sign a note for the same thing. So do they owe 310 or 160? What's the answer? Well, it depends upon if you can read. Okay? Because the lawyer that Paul and I were trying to deal with couldn't read. And he kept saying, she owes 310. And I go, no, she owes 160. And he goes, but she's signing notes for 150 and 160. And I go, yeah, but did you read? But it's, did you read? No, yeah, I just, uh, but I'm looking to, you know, whatever. Okay, so let's talk about what he couldn't read. All right, we're gonna try and make this pop out on the screen. But this is the addendum to the note that we would use. Okay, so there, we're gonna make it pop out. Pay ye herein by acceptance of this note acknowledges his, her, their duty to the payor herein to pay any obligation that may be owed, which is evidenced by a note of even date given in favor of blank custodian, Quest Trust, custodian FBO, Carol Burton IRA, number 12111, by borrowing LLC in the sum of $150,000 plus interest at whatever. So let me walk you through what that technical language that that lawyer couldn't understand when he read it means, okay? 
the payee herein. Who's the payee? The person making the payment or the person getting the payment? Which is it? The payee is the person getting or receiving the payment. So the person in the $160,000 promissory note, the payee, i.e. the trustee of my trust, by accepting this note acknowledges their duty to the payor, which is the borrower, payor, borrower, okay, or and or, okay, herein to pay any obligation that, which is evidenced by a note of even date. Even date means the same day. My borrower is signing two notes, 160 and 150, same day. Even date. So we got the same borrower on the same day signing two notes, and we're going on an even date, given in favor of Quest Trust Company, custodian, FBO, Carol Burton, IRA number, blah, 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 by borrowing LLC. Okay? See where we're going? So that means on the payment made on the 160 loan, if I agree to accept it, with the agreement to accept it comes the responsibility of now I've got to make the payment to the underlying out of that payment. So I can take in a gallon, but I got to give away three and a half quarts over here. And I'm left with half a quart. Okay? Is that making sense yet? Or am I going too fast? Lori? Pardon me? Because I'm making two loans, one's wrapping the other one, and I want to make sure that Carol's custodian knows that she has her money out making just nine and a half percent? Can you do that one note to borrow? Hang on, hang on. Can I have. <laughs> so I've been doing them in one note, and so my question is why wouldn't, why can't you do it in one note? I'd love to see how you're writing it. Okay. That's, yeah. that, I don't know because I haven't read what you, I haven't, I haven't written your paperwork for you. Yeah. We've just been breaking it down, like exactly who's putting in what on okay. one note and one deed of trust. What it sounds like you're doing is your note is then um, containing a lot, a lot of what I use in the, form of an intercreditor lending agreement, spelling out the relationship between different lenders all in the same document. It is, it's okay. all in the notes. Yeah, okay, all right. If you do it that way, you can get away with it. But so I'm doing it this way for a different reason. I'll get to it, why I'm doing it. Five minutes, great, I'm almost done. All right, so here's the mortgage language. This is the other part that lawyer couldn't read. This mortgage is subject to a mortgage in favor, in, in favor of blank, dated of even date and recorded immediately prior to and senior to this mortgage. The indebtedness reflected in this mortgage includes the indebtedness in said mortgage. Therefore, the grantee herein, the person holding the lien, by acceptance of this lien, does specifically agree to pay any payments due pursuant to said prior and senior mortgage. I'm holding the $160,000 mortgage. By accepting it, I'm saying I am subject to and inferior to the $150,000 mortgage. I need to make sure the payments on this $160,000 go to satisfy the $150,000. So when I get paid off early, my payoff includes what goes to them. All right? All right, now I gotta wrap this up. How to be the third pig is what I've been trying to cover here, and I've given you these ideas for one specific simple reason. We have seen a host of change in the last two years. We've even seen a lot of change in the last six months since we were last together for DealMaker in September of now till now. If you think the pace of change is gonna slow down, you're wrong. It's gonna to continue to accelerate. I have no idea what's coming and when it's gonna come, but I'm rather certain, and I know other people in the room agree with me, the credit markets are gonna to start to dry up and tighten up, but people are still gonna need money for deals, and here's your tools for how to take these two tactics, be the third pig, have fun, 
help people, and make tax-free money, okay? So let me wrap this up. Um, go to henrycuellar.com to donate, because those of you that send me a screenshot, there's my email address, I'm going to give you loan docs for my 10 to 12 process. That's the application, the note, the mortgage or deed and deed of trust, the assignment of rents, personal guarantee, those five docs. I'd normally sell that for over $250 a pop. I think I normally sell it for $297, okay? I'm gonna give it to you when you send me a screenshot showing you gave 250 bucks to my friend Henry Cuellar. All right? Is that a fair deal? Henry's been there for us. We need to be there for him because when your friend is in a fight, you show the frick up. It's that simple. All right. Those of you that don't know anything more about me and you want to read my email newsletter, go to watsoninvested.com. Please sign up for it. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I <laughs> surrender back the balance of my time. <laughs> All right. No, no, no. Stay here. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. So do you guys... Um, you know, all deals, all kinds of deal making does not have to be hard assets. It could be paper. Was that your takeaway? Jeff, you can, you can take financial deal making and take it to that next level mm -hmm. today. If somebody wants to learn to use the financial calculator, how important is that in your opinion? Because I saw a lot of like glazed looks in people's eyes. I think it's absolutely crucial to take the step from beginning to intermediate. You've got to learn how to run a financial calculator. And there are some excellent courses out there if you want to just do it online. Um, Cashflow Depot's got one. My friend Bill Cook's got a course. Um, you can go do a two or three day event with my friend Gary Johnson. He does it twice a year, once in Atlanta, once in California on um, financial freedom principles and he walks you through a financial calculator. It is a, it, when you understand how to use a financial calculator and then write your paperwork according to those results and those numbers, it takes your game to a whole nother level. It takes your investing to a whole nother level. Okay, thank you guys. We're gonna take like three minutes for Mary here and then we're gonna eat lunch, okay? So Mary, I'm gonna turn this right over to you. Now you're gonna explain AIM, right? Yeah. Again, other than so better. Gonna okay, I'm gonna introduce Laurie who's gonna explain it. Uh, we wanted to give you a little more details about the membership I talked about yesterday, the Alternative Investing Movement. And this is Laurie Barwick, who is our COO, and she's better at explaining this stuff than I am. So I'm going to turn it over to her. Uh, before I do that, what I've got up is the um, website for the freebie on the charitable, um, the leave, le leaving a lasting legacy that we talked about yesterday. So this is just how you get to that website. It's also the QR code on the flyer we have. Uh, that's how you get to the freebie, and I'll show you a little bit about that website when Laurie's done. Hey, everybody. Um, I just wanted to give a little more information because Mary doesn't like to talk about herself, doesn't like to talk about herself, and feels like she's bragging, but she's really not because she's incredibly knowledgeable. So I don't have a dog in this fight, so I'll brag on her. Um, I've known her, obviously, since I was 10. She's one of the smartest people I've ever met. She retains more information it's kind of scary what all is in that brain. And she has wanted to do this for a really long time because she wants to help people. She wants people to learn about this alternative investments and how to better their life through finances. So that's how this all came to be. It's been a dream of hers for about four years. So now we're finally here. And it's an education platform that will consist of videos, educational videos, we'll um, have a Facebook group a private Facebook group, you can ask questions. She'll answer those questions on the Zoom call once a week for an hour and a half. Question and answers, topics will be discussed. Also, the Facebook group's a great place for networking and meeting people and discussing different types of alternative investing. Um, it's a really special program, and we're really trying to just develop a new community of people that want to learn and be educated and do it the right way in a safe, successful way. So that's kind of our goal, and... Um,
if you hit the Count Me In, that's going to take you to the page with a membership. And you can read about the membership. So that gives you all the information, and then you can decide if it's a good fit for you. So this is just a recap of the things that we have. Yeah, so we're, we're basically trying to do um, a one-stop shop for education on 10 to 12 different asset classes, plus bonus modules on estate planning, asset protection planning, um, 10, uh, 1031 exchanges, self-directed IRA investing. Um, we will have videos and instruction from beginning to advanced. We'll bring on guest experts for anything that I am not an expert in myself. Um, we'll have some resources, checklists, maybe some templates, some due diligence stuff. And it's really for everybody, like I said, from the beginner to the advanced. And anybody who either wants to start doing this, anybody who's in one asset class and wants to switch to one they're not familiar with, or anyone who wants to level up in the asset class they're already working in. And we're very excited about it. Uh, I think it's gonna be great. It's quite the undertaking for us. Um, it's a lot, lot to do, but we're very, very excited about it. And Jim asked me to launch it here. So I feel very grateful to you, Jim, for pushing me to do this. And because of that, uh, we are giving everybody at DealMaker a good price through the end of this month. And it's really our hope, my hope specifically, that you guys will be some of our founding members because this is my favorite event of the year. I come here every year and I would love it if my deal maker buddies were our founding members. So thank you. That was good.